Good morning, everyone, and welcome back uh, in our special public program, Media Explosion, that, as you know, is a cooperation, uh, New Academy of Fine Arts and La Triennale di Milano, under the framework of the public program Upside Down of La Triennale di Milano. Today, we have with us uh, Lev Manovic, professor, writer, but as usual, the introduction of our speaker is up to Amos Bianchi, professor Amos Bianchi, that is with me, the co-curator of this special public program, uh, Media Explosion. Uh, so uh, very quickly, today we have a double honor, if I can, because we will have with us, we have with us um, uh, Stefano Boeri, president of La Triennale di Milano, and also the dean and director of New Academy of Fine Arts, Guido Dattoni, for an institutional greeting. So if I can, I would like to start immediately with Stefano. And I would like also to say thanks personally to Stefano, to Guido and to Amos uh, uh, for the possibility to be a curator of this uh, public program that, as you know, today is the last seminar uh, of uh, this uh, amazing experience uh, uh, of cooperation La Triennale di Milano and New Academy of Fine Arts. Thanks, uh, Stefano, and it's up to you. Thanks very much. We don't hear you. Uh, maybe, okay. Okay, no? okay. So thanks, uh, Leonardo. So on behalf of the Milano Triennale, uh, I would like to express my, my great satisfaction in hosting today uh, the thought of uh, Lev Manovic uh, and his crucial uh, reflection on the future of culture, media, and, and this hopefully post-pandemic phase. I, I, I also want to, to thank uh, Leonardo for having built this um, opportunity and uh, NABA, Nova Academia di Belle Arti, and his director Guido Tattoni and Amos Bianchi for following us to, to start a collaboration that I'm sure uh, it will be more and more intense. Thank you so much, and Lev, I'm so happy to see you. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Stefano Boeri. I also would like to uh, say something before we start. I don't want to steal too much time from this uh, lecture that all of you are waiting for. Uh, this is the last of the uh, lecture series we have organized with the Annali Media Explosion around the human. Uh, we had Joanna Zinisca, we had Stefano Quintarelli, Margaret Atwood today, we have the pleasure to hear Levmanovic. Um, this kind of uh, meetings um, set itself in a context in which NABA is a forward-looking academy. Uh, it was born 40 years ago with the idea of working with the academic tradition and uh, employing a more contemporary language. And 40 years later, we still um, embody that sentiment and we wonder what's going to be the next contemporary language, what's going to be uh, culture in 10, 20, 40 years. So today's um, lecture really fits perfectly our academic intent that we uh, continue doing in class every day. Um, so we even have a whole study area, the new technology of fine arts that Professor Bianchi leads, um, that is even more involved in uh, experimenting how art, products, events, technologies uh, are going to be in the future and to um, explore and inquire in um, you know, what's the relationship between all these entities, what, what, what's going to be uh, around these factors uh, and how human beings will interact with them. Uh, so analog digital ecosystems, human and non-human uh, entities uh, indifferently uh, with which we will go into um, interface uh, more and more organic and inorganic uh, elements uh, with smoothness, uh, let's say, uh, very smoothly and seamlessly, that's the word. Um, so that's how today's uh, lecture is really um, perfectly fit in this research context that we uh, bring uh, forward every day with our practice. Uh, and uh, Manovic's perspective is certainly welcome and interesting uh, for our students that I see uh, very numerous in the audience, so thank you. And also uh, the general public, people that are not our students that I also see. Um, very short time more for some thanks, as this is the last of these encounters. Uh, obviously, I would like to thank um, uh, very deeply Triennale and Stefano Boeri uh, for the hospitality and the um, partnership we had in organizing this series of events. Also, uh, Damiano Gulli, uh, who um, really actively cooperated with us in realizing those four 
meetings. Professor Bianchi, Professor Capo are for curating those uh, lectures. Our communication office with Francesca Zocchi and Ginevra Scuto for uh, taking care of all the organizational parts and the communication and um, Ilaria for the uh, digital uh, department. Our guests, our students, and all of you who are uh, so uh, numerously participating to these classes. So thank you very much. I'll pass it on to Professor Bianchi and enjoy today's class. Thank you. So <clears throat> thank you very much, Guido. Just very, very few words. Just to say, I graduated in philosophy uh, 20, oh, 20, more than 20 years ago. And then I moved uh, to media studies and communication studies. Uh, and uh, I just want to say that uh, the encounter with uh, the language of new media in 2001, uh, a, a very uh, grounding book about the, the contemporary culture of digital media uh, written by Lev Manovic in 2001 was uh, a, a fundamental meeting, was uh, for me the opportunity to review uh, an understanding of what uh, media were at that time uh, by uh, new, some new reflection deriving from the appearance of uh, such a big paradigm uh, that's the digital world. Uh, and uh, in the last years, I've been following a lot of the, the other production by Lev Manovich. Uh, I'm referring to Software Takes uh, Software Takes, Com uh, Takes Command uh, to um, aesthetics of artificial intelligence and the very, very recent cultural analytics. Culture and analytics, two words that uh, uh, sometimes, you know, when you come from the field of uh, humanities, they, they seem not related. They look, uh, we feel they are not related by at the opposite. Uh, I hope that by this lecture, uh, that's whose title, How to Predict the Future of Culture, is so meaningful, uh, Lev Manovich will reveal us his approach to this topic and his approach by which he is able to combine humanities and numbers, let me say, uh, in a, such a, in a, one unique theoretical reflection. I just want to add one thing. Lev Manovich is famous worldwide as a theorician, but he is also a uh, an artist, he's also a designer, he's also a person who in class, in his classes, experiments, put in practice his theories. He's one of the person in the world who is able to provide us some ideas, some new meaningful ideas about medias, both from the practical perspective and from the purely theoretical one. And that's the kind of approach we try to carry out in our academic fine arts. So I don't, uh, uh, I leave immediately room to Professor Manovich. I hope our audience to enjoy this conference. And uh, you have a bet button, Q&A, please uh, write any question you, you like to raise to our very welcome guest. Thank you, Professor Manovich. I leave Thank you so much. You. Yeah. Thank you so much for this invitation. You know, uh, I just yelled at all the people who invited me because I couldn't find the email the link. So I hope you'll forgive me, uh, but it's like a ultimate, ultimate horror, right? Of a Zoom era is you can't find the link. Um, I want to say that I'm deeply honored and I'm nervous because I'm in front of really my heroes. Um, but I have, you know, some maybe good news for all of us. Uh, recently, I realized that I do have quite a number of people who are interested in what I'm doing in Milan, in Italy, Milan, in, in, including Milan. I think maybe because Italy is out of all countries today, is the one which is still very interested and take very seriously aesthetics. But aesthetics is not just about beauty or decoration, it's not about wallpaper. It's a way which makes us human, right? We humans had paintings and songs and dance tens of thousands of years ago before we had language, law, philosophy, and business, right? about 70,000 years ago before Microsoft Excel. And, uh, and I think Italians are the ones who understand it. Uh, but with the good news is that um, I just was invited a few weeks ago to spend maybe two months uh, next May and June, so not this year, but the following year, uh, as a guest of University of Turin. And uh, I hope, you know, I said yes, of course, immediately. 
So I hope that things will be okay by next summer and then I'll be able to spend more time and of course, you know, plenty of beautiful cafes to visit in Milan and amazing, amazing people to be uh, stimulated from. I don't know if I'll have time to get into it, but what I just spent 15 years doing, which is trying to figure out if we can use computers to understand explosion of contemporary culture and to be able to see all the creativity, including work all with students, something which I call cultural analytics. The key idea actually came from a meeting I had in Milan in a May of 2005 when I visited, I unfortunately I don't remember his name at the moment, you know, a very famous Italian designer, industrial designer, and I saw his work um, where he was trying to take 100 most successful models of chairs right, designed in the 20th century and put them in a kind of six dimensional space. I said, oh my God. So this kind of multi-dimensional spaces, which I also use in business, you know, can be a new way to visualize, make sense, and create more inclusive cultural histories. So uh, as I understand, this lecture is aimed at students. And in fact, uh, this new topic, which I've been developing since last fall, how to predict and think about culture in 10, 20, 30 years from now, I'm developing this topic uh, with students. Uh, so I first taught a seminar for the best, most uh, Western uh, Russian university last fall, uh, Russian School of Economics, where I had the best students I've had in my life. Uh, and now I'm teaching it also at the uh, University of Tel Aviv. So uh, instead of my usual slides, in a second, I will share a screen. In fact, I'll be sharing with you the same class materials I'm using in my class. So I'll be kept taking you for a class. So you'll get like a very compressed version of this class in about 40 minutes. Uh, so far, I had the opportunity to teach it over six or eight weeks. Great. Perfect. Okay. So um, the idea for this topic came to me, in fact, maybe four or five years ago, when I realized that uh, we're surrounded by institutions, you know, companies, non-governmental organizations, consultants, who in the business of predicting the future, but the future which we talk about somehow never includes culture. Right? So science fiction movies and novels, uh, NGOs, think tanks, and many others make predictions about ours, about the future, but these predictions seem to only concern social and economic aspects of human life, technology, space travel, the impact of climate change, uh, countries' economies, population growth, and so on. In fact, we are never told what kind of culture we may have decades from now fashion, literature, cinema, uh, social media, visual art, theater, performance, all these wonderful things which makes us human are absent from these predictions. And when people do want to think about cultural future, we seem to always focus on technology, right? In fact, there's probably expectations from some of you that I'll be talking today about technology because many people have this wrong idea that Lech Menevich is the one who writes about technology, whereas I'm the one who writes about art. And the reason I focused on new media like some of us 25 years ago is that that was a new kind of means to make new statics, to create space and time. If it was 100 years ago, I would be working film, photography, x-rays, uh, fax, and probably would be assistant to Mahol and Ash in Bauhaus, right? But now new media is no, no longer new. You know, we have to think ahead. And why is it important not to spend too much time to think about future culture in relation to technology? Because technology never really matters. It never completely determines the kind of culture we have. Right? Yes, people connected the shift to capitalism, uh, to development of Renaissance perspective, but it doesn't determine you know, all the varieties, all the variability, you know, all the poetics or perspective we saw among various Italian painters in the, in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. Yes, certainly uh, the film and photography were using technologies over time 
20th century cinema was based on 19th century technology of electricity and electric motor. But again, right, even though we see the technologies has influenced the arts and culture, we never completely determine the full variety, the full breadth, the full richness of human aesthetics, the narratives, the spaces, the times, you know, the, the looks, and so on. Yes, uh, impressionist painters were made possible, perhaps, by the development of a new technology of oil paints, but uh, we don't want to be the vulgar Marxist, and we don't want to say that culture, aesthetics, art is completely driven by technology. So that's why when I teach this class, I tell my students, I don't want you to think about uh, VR, ER, robots, AI, and so on. Of course, it will be present. Of course, you can get rid of it. It's going to be this noise that will be buzzing in your head because it's impossible today to open any source of media and not to have news about it. And I myself read daily news about new advances in machine learning because I think it's very, very important for culture. But precisely because this is so easy to think about future culture in relation to technology, I don't want us to do it. So uh, having uh, made this as a kind of requirement, we can say, right, we can say, uh, you know, what, uh, when, when, if we don't think about technology, right, what else can we think about? So here is uh, some examples of what I uh, develop and see as topics for this future, let's say, sci-fi digital humanities to also speak. So one is we can think about speed of change. Is the speed of change we see in the 21st century is indeed different from the speed of change in the last 150 years. Around 99, uh, many people thought that the speed of uh, change in 21st century will be about 1,000 times faster. Well, I don't really see it, except maybe in, in the uh, rentless development of computer chips and uh, deeper and deeper neural networks, but definitely not in culture. So we can ask, why do particular historical periods see the accelerated speed in lots of cultural innovation? For me, for example, probably the most important period of cultural innovation in modern history was uh, between 1907 and 1932, when within a few years, people working across all the different art forms and also across things which we named design, we also invented design, these people invented new uh, languages for representing space and time, new communication principles, very fused, for example, symmetry, right? We uh, focused on asymmetry, uh, dynamism, new typography, new principles for architecture, and so on and so forth. And then I think the second equally creative period perhaps was 56 to about 71, and I think the tragedy of our own period is we have amazing technology, amazing communication, and yet intellectually, uh, the kind of discussions we have about arts and culture are way more primitive than what we had, in fact, on television, even 40 years ago. Uh, so uh, can we uh, quantify the speed of cultural change, the speed of cultural innovation? And if we quantify it, can we perhaps even predict when cultural innovations will accelerate next time? Scale. So scale is another very important concept. Uh, it's obvious to me, uh, or at least from my point of view, the single most important dimension of uh, social, cultural, technological change in the last 30 years is the scale. So in 1990, in fact, 30 years ago, we still live in a Cold War era. In 91, the Soviet Union dissolves. The Cold War officially ends, at least for 30 years. Maybe now it's coming back. Uh, and uh, hundreds of millions of people in China, Vietnam, uh, Eastern Europe, and other post-communist countries join the global world, uh, right? With new scale of travel, discount airlines, the telecommunication becomes eventually kind of free. And we have uh, hundreds of millions of new people who join the global world of consumption, leisure, and culture. But not only that, right? So not only we have today, you know, billions of people posting billions of cultural artifacts, images, and so on, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, et cetera, but the scale of professional cultural production have also increased tremendously in this last 30 years. Think about all the new art schools, design schools, film schools, and so on, both physical ones and all the endless programs today which exist online, right? Uh, all the places you can take classes, Skillshare, Coursera, and so on. Um, 
think about all the new Biennales, Kunsthalles, uh, Fashion Week, Design Week, and so on. So both in terms of, like to say, amateur cultural production, consumption, remixing, and participation, and also in terms of professionals, the scale of contemporary cultural world has increased tremendously in the last 30 years. So it has this increase, this increased globalization, this increased interconnectivity led to a new kind of cultural renaissance? I'm not sure. And what in general, more theoretically, we can ask is the effect of a scale on culture. Uh, maybe perhaps was something nice about, for example, the Cold War era, because you had one system in the kind of capitalist, capitalist Western world with its own ideas, and you had another system in so-called communist world, they communicated, but they didn't completely follow the chamber. Um, so how can I understand more theoretically the effects of a scale, the numbers of creators and audiences on content and forms of culture? I mean, what is the size of a cultural audience in uh, Milan, you know, in 1700, 1900, or 2000? Uh, in 1870, 1860s, at the time of Dostoevsky, you know, Tolstoy and so on, uh, were only about 300,000 people living in St. Petersburg. So, uh, you know, it was this kind of right pre-Facebook era, so to speak. Uh, what was the size of people in 1925 participating in this avant-garde reinvention of communication languages. Um, and another, another aspect of scale is probably the single most important development of the last 20 years, which is the growth of global middle class. Right, in the last 25 years, the size of global middle class grew up a few times, and mostly this growth, of course, is taking place in Asia. And the internet and social media now allow instant global distribution of new cultural works. So we have both scale in terms of quantities of people, quantities of artifacts, and also the scale of distribution. So how do such developments affect content, form, and aesthetics? Uh, so a couple of more dimensions. And of course, there are many others, but this is just the ones I find to be, I'm more interested in. Uh, question of identity. So contemporary society tells us that we need to express our uniqueness and be creative. You have to create, it's the name of one of the endless, beautiful you know, fashion stores in Seoul. I pass by when we go over every couple of weeks, you know, I didn't mention that for the last uh, year we've been living in Korea. My wife is from here, she's in performing arts. And of course, Asia is now, right, by far the most advanced aesthetically part of the world. So uh, for me, it's very natural to think about the strengths I see here. Uh, so at the same time, the society offers us ready to use elements and templates to create our identities from fast fashion to Instagram filters, PowerPoint templates, uh, various objects you have in 3D software and so on and so forth. So how can we expect this contradiction to play in the future? On the one hand, the mandate to be, to be unique, to express your uniqueness, at the same time, to fashion this uniqueness out of pre-existing elements and templates. And then we can say, you know, uh, bringing a bit more business language to that, how far we can expect customization and localization of products and services to develop in the coming decades, right? Now I go to Amazon web page. My Amazon web page, every time I go over, it gets customized uh, because we have my data, so we recommend me different books, but the aesthetics of a page stays the same, right? Uh, why? Even if in digital world, the aesthetics is not customized according to my aesthetic taste and preferences, you know, obviously it's not happening in the physical world, right? So we we'll still live more or less in a society governed by 19th century idea of mass production. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that we have millions of cable channels, right? Billions of Facebook groups and so on. Aesthetically, we're still somewhere in the 19th century. And now that we are at the word aesthetics, which is my favorite one. Um, so um, I first wrote about aesthetics in relation to Instagram in my book, Instagram, a contemporary image which I've written over a few weeks when we were like in a small village in Thailand. So I was able to focus and then I published it online and it's now translated in Japanese and coming out in Italian. Uh, and then I introduced this idea of aesthetic society, which of course should be very obvious to Italy, but at least in the English language, I couldn't really find anybody using this term. So I said, okay, I'm going to introduce this term aesthetic society. And now I'm developing a new book which is also focusing on this term. 
and I define aesthetic society as the society where aesthetics, uh, design, artistic modernist creativity, originality, innovation play a key role both symbolically and economically. So these concepts have become core values of a whole society as opposed to being available to only selected social groups such as upper classes and professional artists, right? A different way to say it is to say that in aesthetic society, which to me begins to develop in a modern period around, right? 1986, 1996, 1997, so 96 we have wallpaper magazine, right? 97 we have Colette in Paris, the first design store. Uh, even later we have this kind of minimalism coming from Japan. And now I'm in Korea, right? Where every 50 meters there's a cafe with better design than top design hotels in Europe or America, right? I mean, the level of aesthetic sophistication, uh, what I call 200 shades of gray, uh, will whisper of differences between uh, elements is very sophisticated in Korea. And it wasn't like this 10 years ago. So it's not some kind of traditional Korean aesthetics. No, it's something else. But where else this sophistication is going to go in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Sound, uh, touch, uh, smell, and so on. Uh, so a different way to put it is to say that this virus of originality, creativity, make it new innovation, which in the 20th century we used to associate with a particular professional group of professionally trained artists. And this value is, let's say, very available to upper classes, uh, because as you know, in the 19th century, uh, people criticized industrial production because they didn't offer the sophistication. But now in the last 25 years, it became available pretty much to everybody, right? So everybody buys the same phone and it offers the same sophistication. If you're a billionaire, you can't spend a billion dollars on the phone Again, something more sophisticated, right? So your basic iPhone or your basic, you know, uh, uh, Huawei, you know, is, is basically has pretty much the same surface as a more expensive phone. So everybody gets the same sophisticated product. So in the modern period, these values start coming to the center, as I said, after the middle of 1990s, and uh, there are right many company developments. So the reason I'm talking about all this. Uh, with four dimensions is not that they're interesting or not by themselves, but I think with examples of kind of dimensions, we can ask about how these dimensions are going to change, uh, how culture is going to change, excuse me, along with dimensions in the next 20, 30 years, and also can we make some quantitative predictions. The growth of, our, of global middle class, we can predict. The emergence of experience economy, we now live 20 years in the experience economy. The commercialization of a cool, hip, avant-garde, experimental. This begins in the first part of the 1980s. New manufacturing methods, new materials, and adoption of digital technologies all contribute to the development of aesthetic societies. So when you can say what levels of aesthetization of everyday life may reach by 2050. And uh, I'm just going to like kind of you know, come back to your frontal face for a second because we all you know, have seen too many slide lectures. And what I want to say a bit, you know, a bit like paradoxically, right? Forget about the digital. Digital is the past. There is nothing aesthetically interesting about the digital. Uh, the fact that we're now living our life in front of the screens, 20, 30 years from now, we're going to look at this period with big shame. Why did we spend all our best times of our lives in these digital prisons? And this is not to say that I'm Luddite, of course not. I make my living by talking about computers in the future. But what I'm trying to say is that the sensorial, the physical, the relational, right? Uh, the whole wealth of human senses, uh, which is we experience, right? And we use in communication. And our media until the 19th century was more or less using the senses, right? You know, even uh, something like using, you know, paper and a typewriter, right? With a certain physicality to it. You know, right? When this very particular period where everybody looking at the small, tiny screen, and all the screens are the same. We all made from rectangular pixels. This is not. This is really a dark middle. This is really, I would call, digital middle ages. And this is going to go away. Uh, trust me, 10, 15 years, or maybe 20 years maximum, we'll have some new sensorial, three-dimensional, uh, holographic, uh, but also very material interfaces. And uh, this is one thing I predict that in 30 years, 
we may still have images, we'll probably have video, although most of creativity probably will move into three-dimensional sphere, a kind of holographic. But I think the screen mm, will have to change. Otherwise, you know, people will just have to, people will just, you know, don't want to live in this kind of culture. Okay, so that's kind of like one approach to thinking about the future, looking at this very broad economic, social media changes over the last 30 years, you know, the end of Cold War, the beginning of the experience economy, the design wave, the rise of global middle class. And the nice thing about it is that we can predict some of things, right? We can predict, for example, what are going to be the biggest global cities 20, 30 years from now. We can predict more or less the demographic structure of society. And then perhaps, you know, the fact that we'll have these predictions, the fact that we have these numbers, perhaps we can use it to think about culture. But now let me show you a second approach. Uh, I will not have time to talk about third approach, which is looking at the modern art, design, architecture, filmmaking, and focusing on the work of avant-garde uh, designers, architects, filmmakers, writers, and so on. People like you know, the Russian so-called constructivists in places like Bauhaus, but more importantly, places like Futimas, which some of you know was a more important theoretically and practically design school in Russia between 1919-1929. In fact, we were the first ones, not the Bauhaus people, to introduce this idea that uh, the artists should become designers and define new aesthetics of industrial society. I mean, Bauhaus only got this idea, I think, by 24. Um, so I can talk about it, you know, in the last uh, five to 10 years, more and more materials have been published and exhibited about uh, 1920s, 1930s in Russia. And like many people, I'm realizing that everything you know about Russian avant-garde, it's a tip of an iceberg. And there is so much where, uh, there are so many ideas where which are completely innovative, which I hope we'll see realized in the next 10 to 20, 30 years. Uh, like I'll just give you one example. Uh, so in 2019, I was lucky to be in Moscow five times. And I saw the pioneering exhibition about the first museum of modern art. What do you think was the first museum of modern art? It was in New York? Of course not. Americans steal everything, right? You know, uh, Americans you know, steal uh, these ideas and they tell you that we were first. Of course not. The first museum of modern art was formed in Moscow in 1919. All of avant-garde artists, you know, Malevich, uh, Tatlin, Kandinsky, you know, were part of this museum. And this museum was still very innovative. It's still more innovative than anything we have today because it was a museum run by artists. Artists are making decisions what works to buy. And uh, it was a museum which was conceived not as a place to archive and exhibit things, but as a place of research. And they put uh, for themselves four goals. One is to figure out what to collect. Shall we collect particular artists, you know, like Cezanne, right? Leading up to Malevich, like we're only particular avant-garde artists, or shall we collect everybody? It's an interesting question, right? Why does museum should buy everything? Just because it costs money, right? Um, the second thing was how to scientifically organize exhibition practice. What are the different principles to use in exhibiting a work? So Malevich, for example, said that works should be exhibited not according to the chronology, but according to the contrast, the way he arranges elements in his suprematist compositions. Uh, the third thing was to actually have artists in residence. Can you imagine 1919 artists in residence in a museum run by artists? to help his artists develop new art for the future. And the fourth thing was to establish a new scientific study of art, what we now call digital humanities or cultural analytics. We had this idea, we started in 1923. For example, we would study uh, art history according to scientific principles. We would also study uh, using psychology the effect of different installation methods on perception. Uh, we had a lab, and then of course, 1929, everything was closed. So this is why, right, I'm going back to Russian avant-garde because I see so much where, which is still very revolutionary, but still hasn't been realized. But what I want to do is, you know, we started a bit right late, so I think I can have another 10 minutes, right, 10, 15 minutes. I want to introduce a third approach uh, to think about the future, which is more directly connected uh, to what I've been focusing on in the last uh, 15 years, which is so-called cultural analytics, connected to digital humanities, digital art history, computational humanities, uh, culture economics, all these things which mean approximately the same thing, which is looking at the culture as data and using data science methods uh, as a way to study culture. 
And what uh, people were able to do in the last, you know, five, 10 years in these fields is to get hold, right? Create certain large cultural data sets. For example, you know, half a million popular songs in the last 60 years, uh, 10,000 movies over hundred years, right? Two, two million paintings, even use the kind of visualization and data science methods and be able to reveal certain long-term patterns which quantify cultural development. So now that this work is becoming more mainstream, right? Digital humanities is becoming too popular. I said, okay, Lev, you should, you, you were one of the pioneers of this work in relation to visual images, now it's becoming popular, let's do something else, right? When the field becomes successful, I can try to move on. So I said, maybe I can talk about, maybe I can apply this map to think about the future. So I will show you just in the last uh, next 10 minutes, very briefly examples of this work. And this work is not talking about the future, but it's showing us the cultural past, let's say last hundred years or sometimes longer in a new quantitative fashion. And while this is probably not going to be by itself enough to give us really profound, deep, amazing visions of culture in 2040, 2050, it's very interesting, right? Because you can say, okay, if these trends develop, what kind of music remixes will have 10 years from now? If this trend develops, what's going to be the structure of film editing 10 years from now? Right? Can we also anticipate, for example, what happens to remix? Is remix going to continue to govern the modern culture for the next 20 years? So let me show you a few examples. And then we'll have time for discussion, I hope. Okay. So here we go. Okay. Uh, just a moment. Okay, here we go. Yes. Uh, so by the way, you know, I will uh, I will uh, copy this link. Um, I will actually edit. Uh, I put like a Facebook an announcement to this lecture. So I will add this link where. Um, so all the stuff is online. So you can basically read all these materials. So very few things, right? So this is a work uh, from 2012, where what we've done is we created a data set of 120,000 uh, important cultural figures. And uh, we basically visualized the uh, birth and death places of these figures. And then we kind of, we see this very interesting idea of culture as a history of cultural migration, right? So people first, we focus on Italy, and then it goes to Asia, and then it goes to America, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one color corresponds to like where a person was born in red, even blue, right, where a person you know, died. And, uh, you know, it's basically looking at the data for about 600 centuries. Sorry, I'm just going very quickly. And you get this very, very interesting idea of culture uh, through the uh, death, uh, birth and death places and like places and dates of like tens of thousands of individuals, right? So this is again, maybe not directly applicable to the future, but it gives us the idea. So for example, inspired by this, I would like to do study uh, hypothetically because I don't think I would ever be able to do it is to take like 10, 20, 30 leading design architecture film schools such as yours, or let's say, you know, the architecture school at Columbia University and be able to track the movement uh, geographically and professionally of all the graduates in the last 30 years because it will give us a great, a great picture of globalization, right? And how ideas get diffused from these places uh, to the rest of the world, right? Uh, so this is one example. Uh, oops, just a moment. What did I? Uh... Okay, okay, sorry. Did I just? Sorry, okay, okay. Okay, shoot this. Sorry, close by mistake. Um, so this is something else. Um, this one, yeah. So this is actually from my own lab from like 20, 12 years ago. Uh, this was one of the things, first things we have done. Uh, we got a hold of uh, all the covers of Time magazine. So Time is a very important illustrated American picture magazine started to become out in 1923. And using very simple uh, software, which I wrote myself, we created some visualizations where we took all the covers of this magazine and we organized them left, uh, left to right, top to bottom in order of publication from 1923 until now. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm going to skip analysis, but I found about 14 different trends. We think which you see on the surface of a transition from black and white to color, 
and there are these different color periods, and there's a shift from painting to photography, et cetera, et cetera. But you also see certain changes in meaning and in semiotics of communications. In the beginning, it's so portraits of particular people, and background is completely semiotically neutral. It doesn't communicate anything. And then at a certain point, right, we start seeing this covers where image becomes illustration. It uh, talks about some ideas or concepts, the way portraits, for example, function maybe in the uh, 17th, 18th century. And then uh, in the 1990s and 2000s, right, we have a deferred paradigm where we have Ava portraits, again, which are very neutral, or we have uh, covers which don't feature people, but for, you know, but feature some concept. So what you have is with very different modalities, right? Different semiotic regime of communication. But the nice thing about these visualizations is you see that you know we don't change overnight, right? That uh, this changes in proportion between one another is very gradual. So let's say by you know 1925, all the covers, right, are covers of people. And then slowly you start seeing these covers which have some kind of semiotic background with some meanings. And then let's say by uh, 2010, there's maybe 40% of these covers. So it's a very gradual change, which take place over the course of decades, right? And then uh, we also did other visualizations where we, for example, measure visual properties of this cover. So here we measure average saturation. Again, some you know this works, so I'm showing it very briefly. And uh, what you see is that uh, the covers, which are almost black and white at the bottom, the covers which are most colorful on the top. And again, you have this very gradual uh, wave-like patterns. Uh, and it also shows you how difficult it is, right, to predict culture because things, right, keep going up and up and up, right? And you think that we will continue, but here you see the variability becomes small in the 70s, partly maybe because of this kind of new generation, right, after the expansion of the uh, 1960s. Uh, and it kind of coincides with the uh, oil crisis in the West, right? Uh, and then uh, things go up again, and then we go down. So it also shows you how it may be very hard to predict cultural history, and that's why it's so tempting, right? I like to do things which are impossible. And then here's another example. So it's a work of a psychologist from Cornell University, James Cutting and his students. He's been doing it for over 25 years. They got a database of about 10,000 films, mostly Americans, but also some Europeans. And what we do is we measure various attributes of his films, even see how his attributes change over time. Um, so here we took right around 9,400 9, English language films, and each film is represented as a point, and then uh, the X right position of a point is the time when the film was released, and the Y position is the average shot length, right? So we see in the beginning, the average shot length is about 15 seconds, even by the 2010, right, it's almost three times less. It's about four seconds, uh, you know, and then we see some very interesting challenges, right, because the data has this high variability. It's not clear what is the best way to fit the data, and depending on how you fit the data, right, that's why you know, we need to learn a bit of statistics. You get a different idea of cultural history because you can fit it in a straight line, or you can fit it as this curve, which will say things are accelerating after 1970, and also, if you break it, for example, into European films and American films, so it turns out, oh, you know, sorry, this is, uh, no, no, this is something else. Somewhere it's here, so it turns out European films are changing much more slowly. So, of course, there's a danger when you aggregate too much data and you don't differentiate it, right? So, so you can say, okay, so how fast are the films are going to be by 2050? But that's also not so simple, but eventually they're going to run, right, into the limits of human uh, cognition and reception. Uh, so there's also very interesting work about where you can actually quantitatively see the emergence of postmodernism in cinema through big data. There's a very interesting work about the emergence of literary diction. I'll just show very briefly from Ted Underwood, perhaps the most interesting American theorist of digital humanities. So here we're looking at uh, uh, basically thousands of uh, texts uh, from a few centuries you know, in English. And uh, by um, coming up with a very interesting measure, which is proportion of words which appear in this text, which entered the English language before 1150 versus after, uh, we see this very interesting separation. So black line is a fit curve for normal nonfiction prose. And then poetry is this purple line. And this is a prose. So you can see how in the beginning, right, 
maybe before literature in a modern sense has emerged, there is not much difference in terms of language use between these three different types of texts, but some will become more and more differentiated. It makes sense, right, that poetry is more differentiated and prose is somewhere in the middle. And, you know, so then, of course, you also wonder if it's going to continue, right? So that's an example of how you can look at certain aspects of literature. Uh, and uh, finally, I just want to show you one last thing. Uh, and then I think we'll have time for questions, I hope. In just a second. Um, I think it's here. Yeah, the students ask me for readings. So I give them some readings. And uh, let me just see where I, okay, here it is, yeah. I just want to show you the last thing. Uh, so since I've been living and visiting Korea for many years, as you know, uh, Korean popular culture, TV drama, music, so-called K-pop is one of the leading right cultural industries in the world, right? More people watch K-pop in Hollywood or Bollywood, uh, and it's very, very sophisticated. So I was trying to figure out you know, what makes it so sophisticated. And uh, again, can we also predict, for example, how music videos are going to develop. And I found this uh, just one video uh, by somebody in a, like, I think, professional editor. Uh, so just somebody in uh, LA, and he says basically what, what he realized when he started to analyze K-pop videos, he said many Western music videos may just feature two, three scenes, and you just cut back and forth in front of them. Like he said, the Korean ones, they may have 40, 50 different scenes. And like he said, the reason these videos are so beautiful is they're very complex. Uh, and even if the same kind of stage appears more than once, you don't realize it. So here again, you have a very interesting dimension, which is the changes in visual complexity. And again, you can wonder where it's going to go. And eventually, are we going to run against the limits of human cognition and perception? Or will we kind of learn to somehow enjoy uh, videos, uh, or which are maybe, you know, I don't know, 900 frames per second, and every frame is a different scene. Who knows? Yeah, so he basically says visual complexity is what, in fact, makes these videos beautiful. And, uh, I will we'll just play it for a couple of couple of you know few seconds and then we'll go to discussion. So it keeps changing, right? Anyway. All right. So 23 performance setups for one video, right? Um, so this is it. Uh, of course, I was only able to scratch the surface or scratch the surface of the surface, but that's enough. Um, so I think the take home points is that it's a good idea to try to predict the future because if you're now 20 or 22, 23, I'm talking about the students in 30, 40 years, right? You'll just be in the kind of prime of your career. And uh, in my own work, uh, not you know, you know, I think I was able to predict some aspects of the future from time to time, right? So in 1982, I realized that in fact I should probably focus my work on digital media because one day it'll be important. In 84, maybe only 40 people were working in computer animation. Um, in uh, 93, I was the first person to kind of make the website and basically started publishing everything I wrote on the website. So I made my career from a website and so forth, right? So uh, I'm not sure what methods I used, right? Uh, we were definitely not quantitative, but it's good to be able to predict the future, even in the next five to 10 years, not talking about 30 or 40, is a way to kind of focus your career. Um, and of course, it's also very interesting to us. And one of the reasons I kind of want us to think about it is I'm a bit tired of what I call presentism, right? Presentism of human culture, right? Everything is about uh, what happened in the last five seconds. And now every single cultural institution wants to give panels and do exhibitions about COVID-19, right? Uh, after two weeks of being in isolation, some artists start making exhibitions. Oh my God, I'm sitting in isolation. You know, to me, it's, you know, it's a bit small scale, right? So I kind of want young people to think on the scale of you know, 10, 20, 30 years. 
and also to think about other things besides climate change, you know, besides the fact that we'll have no jobs because all the jobs will be in Asia or given to AI, uh, to try to bring back this kind of longer term perspective, which I think humanities used to have and sometimes still have, and also uh, to make people realize that, you know, technology is not everything, right? Uh, what kind of novels we're going to read or literary works we're going to read in 2050. Yeah, even if its works are uh, written by computers, they're written for us, right? So their aesthetics, you know, uh, their plots, uh, their narration descriptions will, will not be just about technology. That was cyberpunk was in the 1980s, it already happened, right? Um, so this is my new project. And uh, as you can see, it's a way to also unite some of my previous interests and to go forward. And it's also a way to ask a completely impossible question. And I think we have to ask impossible questions. And also that's my message to the students, because if you set your goal to be up there, you'll never get there, but you can jump up to here. And if you set your goal here, you will not even jump that high, right? So I think it's a good idea to only work on impossible questions. Uh, and being a university, I have this liberty to do that. So um, I hope uh, you'll have a few questions for me. And thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I'm the one who thank you, Professor Manovich, for your very, very inspiring uh, and challenging presentation. And uh, okay, the Q&A se uh, session is open, but I start uh, with uh, the first question. Uh, data science. Uh, you, you quoted data science uh, and uh, you applied data science in your work uh, and in cultural analytics, your last uh, publication. We have a lot of it uh, in order to understand uh, the contemporary phenomena. My point is, my question is this one. In this moment, for designer, uh, here we have an audience uh, mostly based, uh, made by designers. Uh, is data science a, a skill a contemporary yeah, designer sure. should have? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, first of all, let me say a couple of things about design. And sorry, I didn't mention, but you know, I couldn't mention everything. You know, I, I want to keep you guys. I want to keep. I want to lock the door and keep you for the next three days. All right. So, uh, so you know, what I wanted to do, but I kind of like was a bit nervous that I lost the link. Uh, is to start by thinking about how the world was different 30 years ago, right? Uh, uh, people didn't use internet yet, only academics, no web, uh, Cold War. We still have like half a world locked in communism. Uh, people still think about that postmodernism is the latest thing, and now nobody remembers it, right? And so on and so forth. But what's more interesting for us, when you think about design today, half of the design fields did not exist. Interaction design, user experience design. Yes, of course, we had, uh, you know, we have spatial design. Maybe it wasn't as important for space design, web design. Uh, all these different, right? I mean, the game design. Uh, all these different design fields emerged between '95 and '98. I remember how, like, I remember, like, I was sitting in LA and person I confronted me said, "Okay, I'm, I'm going to postulate this new field called experience design." And most of these fields emerged because we shift to computers. It will shift to computers or experience economy. So this is what designers have to think about, that you know, maybe half of the designer fields, which will exist 30 years from now, don't even exist today. So shall we learn about data science, AI, computers? Of course, because this is one of the key driving forces of modern society. And if we can understand how computers uh, internet, uh, data analysis, artificial intelligence, machine learning are going to be changing society, we're going to be ahead. So it's not just a question, should we have it as a skill? We should have it so we can make some sense of where contemporary world is going, right? Uh, the second thing is data science is a skill. What does it mean? I think to me, data science, it may be less of a skill. Uh, it's more like attitude. Yeah? Uh, so what I'm trying to do in this project is to say, you know, for uh, thousands of years, you know, the humans thought about cultural history, present, well, we didn't think about future, maybe until the 19th century, qualitatively, and it worked very well. In the late 19th century, we have emergence of so-called social sciences, which try to think about society quantitatively, and it works in some ways. And now we have a next stage, right, which is development of disciplines, including my own little contribution, 
which is a kind of quantitative look at human culture, and it's not going to go away, right? Uh, and to me, it's an attitude. So now, what I want when I want to think about anything, my first my first intuition is: can I also look at this quantitatively? Uh, because probably the existing views are wrong. So if I think about Vincent Van Gogh, right, the most canonical artist, you know, and when I get his paintings, when I analyze them, I mean, I realize that everything we know about Van Gogh is wrong. For example, his most, most, most famous paintings are his least typical, right? So the point is, of course, not to say that, that quantification, data gathering, statistics, and so on is going to replace all our methods. Of course not, but it becomes now a possibility. And I think especially for you know designers uh, who also have other methods, right? I mean, you know, you know, the, I mean, we can have people right write questionnaires. We have focus groups. We have ethnography and so on. But with big data, right, has really opened a new paradigm for designers, right? I mean, you all know about A/B testing and so on and so forth. Uh, so it is a skill, but we also have to think about the limits, right, of big data. Uh, that what people are going to tell you. The way people behave online is not necessarily what we really think. Uh, and we also have to think about the limits of contemporary data science, which is focusing on the kind of digital data. But I think the future of understanding human reception and interaction is uh, what happens here, right? So it's MRI, EEG, eye movements, and development of more sophisticated technologies, which can allow us to perhaps have a bit of more window into what happens inside the brain and the body but not on the scale of 10 people who go inside the MRI machine, but on the scale of, of billions of people, right? So, um, so I hope I gave you a few arguments why we should learn a bit about data science and if we can learn more, we should learn even more. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes, thank you. Uh, well, I go on with a second question. We have a question from our audience. Uh, will climate change crisis uh, compromise uh, uh, the creation forms uh, of culture? I, I, I mean, uh, is going to uh, climate the, 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 this huge crisis uh, to be a turning point uh, in the in the production of future right. culture? Right. Sure. So you know, this is the difference. I think also today and thirty years ago. Of course, we know that some very smart people were already thinking about. You know, the possible climate change and the effect of industrialization as early as the 1960s and 1970s, right? The famous book, Silent Spring. But most of us were not. So, in fact, 1990, uh, 30 years ago was a very optimistic moment, right? You know, the Berlin Wall falls down, everybody kisses. And, you know, the, the new global consumers, right, join the scene. And today we live under this kind of shadow, right, of climate change. How much is going to affect compromise, as you said, or inspire human creativity, human life, it's very hard to say. Uh, when we look at the past, we have this very dark moment, right? Like a black death, right? Uh, you know, and you know, basically, uh, you know, all, all until recently, many countries or sometimes like whole regions, right? Had a huge um, uh, health, uh, economic, demographic crises. Again, think about, you know, the what happens in 1918 in Europe, something like 50 million people died. And only now we realize how visible it was and how much it affected things. And yet sometimes the spirits were also most creative, right? In the human history. So perhaps we live now in this very comfortable life. Everything is working. We have Zooms, right? And uh, thinking about the kind of disruption, which was uh, COVID-19 uh, has created, right? In culture and how of course, for people, especially in performing arts, it was very painful, but also for many people in museums and so on, we started to do all these online events. And for me, you know, I'm going to say something terrible. Uh, last year was one of the best years of my life because I'm sitting in one place, I'm not traveling. I was very lucky in Korea, nothing got locked. And all my friends now have time, right, to talk to me on Zoom. And it's a beautiful life, like what we have now. And uh, maybe, right, maybe, you know, I wouldn't be able to come or you wouldn't invite me if things were so physical. So I think we can think about every crisis as opportunity, not just to kind of quell back, right, and to become secure in our old ways of doing things, but uh, to rethink things and to become more creative. Um, so this is optimist in me. And the pessimist in me, okay, let's put him outside the door. Let's be a bit optimistic. Um, so, you know, so, so I think for many fields, many institutions, 
will use any excuse to become more conservative, whereas others will use any excuse to become more creative. So it depends on what side of the barricades if you're a young student, you want to end up with. So, so draw your conclusions and go over. Uh, so, Professor Manovic, uh, first of all, can you hear me? Okay, so yes. good. Uh, we have another question uh, uh, of our public, but first of all, I would like to ask you something. I'm not sure if this is a good question, but it's just an intuition that I have after your talk if i understand um so you think that uh, the this is also the thesis of your paper computer vision human sense a language of art mm. was published by right. okay so it, it, i think that uh, it, let me know if it's true that your idea is that the numerical representation of data analysis uh, it's a sort of new language for describing uh, cultural artifact, experience, dynamics, and that the human language, like, I don't know, Italian or English, okay, it's not enough to describe uh, this kind of experience of humanity, no? And in some sense, I think that the, the, the thesis of your paper and of your research is that we have a sort of universal language that we can try to use today to describe something. I don't know if it's true or a language that is more of a natural language like, I don't know, Italiano or English or Russian or uh, something. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to ask you, uh, who is the public of, is, of this universal language? Okay, because I yes, think that yes. this is uh, the a core problem of uh, your argument, because in some sense it's true that English uh, it, or Italian, or I don't know, it's not enough to describe uh, human right. experience now, but, but it's clear with the public of Italiano, no? I, I understand. Italiano. I think I understand, I understand your question. Okay. So, Leonardo, you, okay. Okay, you basically just say in English, you killed me, uh, because this is actually one of the most important questions, right? So, um, so let's say, you know, approximately 2,000 years ago, or maybe 1,000 years ago, right, you know, ancient, Greece or ancient Arab worlds, people start to use math, right? And then the science really gets underway in the Renaissance. And the scientists adopt data, what we now call data visualization, right? Graphs, Cartesian space, right? Visual functions and the numbers as a new meta language to talk about the universe. And it allows them to measure things and it allows them to formulate laws like Newton's laws in quantitative, quantitative forms, right? Very good. Okay, how many people work in science today? You know, tens of millions, but not everybody. Okay. So then, <laughs> late, late 19th century, we have emergence of so-called social science, which as Brun Latour pointed out, right, was this very almost futile, perhaps, attempt to make the study of society also scientific and to emulate the science too much, samples, and so on and so forth. Well, you know, how many people speak the language of social science? It's hard to say, not so few, because every day you open what I call newspaper, but I mean, you open your Twitter, right? You open your, your news channel and we talk about, okay, votes or uh, questionnaires or the effect of coronavirus or the effect of different vaccines and we use language of statistics, right? You know, we talk about bias, we talk about not a big enough sample, we talk about percentage. So at least on some basic level, the language of social science, which is the language of social statistics has become the common language, right? So things are not, you see, things are not so bad. And then of course, you look at contemporary moment, you can see, of course, everybody in China, all the high school students, we get computer science, we get math, and that's probably one of the reasons why we're doing so well. And uh, you, people have to learn math and computer science if you're going to have any jobs, right? So from that point of view, you're absolutely right, but at the moment, uh, my idea is to kind of bring this more scientific, uh, ways of describing it to humanities and arts. And by scientific, I don't mean about scientific method. I simply mean more precise, right? You know, because if I can talk about, you know, different colors or textures or, you know, the shapes of brush strokes, right? On the scale of hundreds of thousands of distinctions, right? You know, it's, it's to me, it's just simply more precise. It sounds maybe a bit, right? A bit utopian and maybe it's only something for professionals, but, uh, perhaps, right, is more as, as a kind of certain math and computer science education would have to become uh, more default. It, it can become, you know, the next, uh, I don't know, decade, two, three, uh, more commonplace because simply people have to learn about data, math, 
to be competitive. Again, I'm not for or against it. I'm, I'm just simply saying I think I think we'll see kind of what's happening. Uh, but I want to say one thing is you know there is one good thing here, right? So what I'm really interested in is precision and the ability to narrate to describe small differences. Why? Because contemporary culture operates with small differences. It's not like postmodernism, which was about, you know, very big things. I go to the store, right? In Korea, you know, it doesn't need to be Zara because we're right, endless local stores, which give me beautiful organic clothes for $10. Yeah, okay, here's, you know, here's part of the store and there's uh, 50 gray dresses, which has different shades of gray and different materials or 50 different white t-shirts, right? So I feel the contemporary culture is very aristocratic in the sense that it operates with small distinctions. And that's why we need, we need a different language. And I think uh, that the human natural languages, Italian, all right, Spanish, Russian, you know, we're very good of categories, but we're not so well of small distinctions, although we do have metaphors, which is very powerful, right? So your question, absolutely, you basically, basically got me to a wall, uh, but I hope what I said is also not completely meaningless, that first of all, we can need it, uh, if we actually to be able to talk about culture of, of our time, which is about the small nuances. And uh, I think what's more important to me is uh, you can kill me in a double way or I can kill myself because there is also ways to criticize this idea, which is, let's say we describe t-shirts or dresses or paintings or you know, uh, 3D designs using hundreds of different dimensions, but maybe it still didn't capture the main thing because you don't, you, maybe you're not able to capture Gestalt. So just because you can right, talk about all the different dimensions, maybe you're missing something. So this is the kind of arguments which in fact keep me up at night, so to speak, right? So just because you have, let's say everybody now speaks math, everybody can do beautiful data visualization, but that may be not enough because uh, the problem is that can we count for our aesthetic experiences by breaking them down into separate dimensions and that actually potentially a big, maybe a bigger problem which we can solve, right? But let's let's think about it then because we haven't gotten where yet. But it's like, so I think we're obviously problems, right? Uh, but ultimately, you know, uh, I, I'm finishing, right? I was educated as a painter since the age of 13. When I was 17, I said, okay, it's very nice. I can make nice painting. How does it really work? I want to describe it. And uh, in a week from now, I'll be 61. I'm still trying to figure it out, right? So it's all, so we see my whole life is just one attempt. Uh, so I try semiotics, but semiotics has the same problem because we use natural language. And now I've you know, been trying you know, computers and visualization and I'm still trying. And, uh, you know, because I want to be able to talk intelligently about millions of beautiful 19th century paintings, which is not cubism or, or suprematism, which is realism, which are undescribed, right? Most of modern art is not described because we don't have a language for it, because it was figuration, right? So anyway, maybe uh, it's a futile path, but that's, kind of, that's been kind of my path. And uh, of course, Itali Italians are smart. We understand that even though I don't say it in America, because in America, for some reason, semiotics became a bad word. Who knows why? You know, I'm a semiotician and, uh, you know, and I can come out of my closet. So uh, I'm I am trying to continue semiotic project, but using kind of different path. Um, and see kind of how far, how far we can go. And if I fail, at least we can say we have tried it. Yeah, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have several questions from our audience, uh, but I, oh, yes. uh, one was, uh, sorry, I, I have to raise one because, uh, you know, when discussing about the topic of this lecture, where we were taking into account also a, a famous quote from Adorno of Keimer that's infecting everything with sameness. That was the effect of the uh, cultural industry. So my question is, uh, we are really say, uh, talking uh, about uh, small distinction. Uh, it looks like a really ground, uh, a ground of the aesthetics, small distinction, delicacy and yes. so on. And on the other side, uh, we feel, uh, let me say, we feel that uh, mm -hmm. the digital apparatuses uh, are moving to a kind of sameness. So my question is, uh, is the prediction of Adorno, better, the prediction, the description formulated by Adorno 70 years ago about the cultural industry, 
that creation of the sameness still working in our digital times or the change of media, the change of media paradigm has opened, has removed this uh, this possibility of uh, the sameness of taste, the sameness of production. Sure, sure. Okay, so I would try to, yeah, so I would try to, you know, because, you know, I, I look at our questions, very really interesting, so I would try to give you short answers, which is impossible, Thank but you. I have to learn. Yeah. Well, so think about Adorn and Hokarn, right? So we're sitting over in LA in 1943, a bit terrified by what we see. Believe me, you know, all Europeans who come to LA have the same feeling. Uh, and then, of course, in the 1950s, you know, the French critics and uh, young authors uh, say, you know, actually, you know, the Hollywood wasn't so bad. It actually was full of auteurs who had individual styles. So already 15 years later, the same Europeans who look at the Hollywood and said, actually, it, it was, you know, it had much more variety. And there were always auteurs. It wasn't just the sameness. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is, you know, uh, as you probably know, one of my key preoccupations, which also drives all this development, is in fact, how do we talk about this better, right? As opposed to you think this, I don't think that, and I think, and I think something else. So when, how can we measure variability, right? Which of course is another very impossible thing, but we can. So in, for example, in the last uh, seven years, there has been a number of papers published where people use data sets of tens or hundreds of thousands of popular songs. And because music has this right kind of formal theory, where music is, I think, supreme art, you can actually quantify to some extent variability. Uh, if I had time, I would even show you a project from New York Times Media Lab from three years ago, where we measure variability of summer hits and we show you how it's changing very systematically. Um, so, um, so we can actually talk about these questions quantitatively. And here's another example, right? Uh, what is the effect of recommendation engines? For example, YouTube, Spotify, Amazon, uh, do people end up looking at more things? Well, it's very hard to study because this data only fully available to the companies. But there was a study 10 years ago where we look at the YouTube and we said, actually, according to our analysis, uh, people who use YouTube recommendations uh, basically watch more different things and more different genres, more different subjects. So it increases your variability. Even two years ago, Spotify also released the research saying, okay, we'll have a look at our data. And according to our data, the average Spotify consumer every month you can on over course of about I think 24 months, you look at you listen to more, more different songs and different genres. So so far, this very few quantitative studies suggest that in fact digital culture has, leads to more variability, not less. So why do all intellectuals don't think don't think so? Right? Uh, we should examine our own assumptions. Uh, but I think right, it's very hard to make this uh, statement general because you can always find examples pro and con. Right? Obviously. Uh, you have another example that uh, as everybody uses Google Analytics, right, and other tools like this, so everybody is now aware about the effect of changes on their Instagram or their website, on their visit to numbers, right? Google Analytics is installed like something 60% of all websites. So 10 years ago, you have a blog, I have a blog, he has a blog, and I start with image, you start a video, I start with text. Now everybody starts with image, everybody knows it gets you more visitors. So that's another example of how, in this case, digital culture leads to more uniformity, not because computer by itself is uniform, but because computer allows us to measure things. And, and once we have these measurements, everybody tries to do the same thing. So the bottom line is that it's definitely possible to find examples where computers lead to more cultural uniformity and to less. Uh, and uh, it kind of depends, right, where you want to look at. I think measuring cultural variability is itself interesting because again, it asks us questions. How do we talk about culture? How do we describe it? And the tools are here, the data is here. So if you want to measure changing variability of web design, you can do it. It's just somebody has to sit down and do that. And the problem is that no, so far people who have the skills are in computer science and we can't wait for them to do it. So ultimately we have to learn these things ourselves if we want to find out these things for uh, cultural areas, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, which, which, which we're interested. But ultimately, I want to say that to me, the single most biggest impact on variability is the connectivity, right? Like I have this feeling, but I don't have proof that 20, 30 years ago, you have all these kind of like islands of people talking about different things. 
you know, right? Every single art project I open, every single, uh, every single, uh, I think, open the arts. It's like environment, climate change. Uh, it's like everybody talks about the same five things, which is terrible, right? Uh, but I don't think again it has to do with computers as a digital device. It has to do with computer as a kind of right, as a as a connective device. And everybody looks at what everybody else is doing. Very few people want to take ch chances. Everybody says, "Okay, we're talking about this. Let's talk about that." So I would like to measure it and see if it actually replaces, right? Uh, so while potentially a computer opens our gives us possibility, right, to talk about anything and to have millions of different interests, it seems to me that the long tail is actually getting shorter. But again, I don't have proof, so I want to measure this. So that's my answer, right? So maybe we have too much connectivity, right? Or maybe people are just too much afraid to fail. Okay, oh, this museum organized an event about COVID-19. Let's organize our event about COVID-19. Oh, this person posted about Notre Dame on fire. Let me also post, right? This kind of collective you know, mimicry behavior, right, is very much encouraged by digital media. Uh, so maybe we have to go back to and um, say something terrible, but I'm not mean, a kind of cold war where, you know, I don't talk to you, you don't talk to me, and we isolate and develop our own ideas. Maybe that's the only way. <laughs> anyway, next question. <laughs> I don't know. I'm also, we are full of questions. Uh, yeah, uh, but I can I can go I can do quickly. Okay, if you have quickly. time, I can do, uh, yeah, okay. I have time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Eves, okay. Eves Laurent, how okay. to apply with video present to record digital artifacts? Um, okay. Uh huh. Yes. Um, it says you're going to answer this question live. Sorry. No. Uh, okay. So basically, how yeah, how to analyze the present? Which I talk about in language, I basically said language of, of, of new media, but I'm trying to feel the present. How can we do it today when present became thicker and, 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 and faster and that's the speed? Well, that's partly I'm focusing my attention on the Russian avant garde because it's not changing. I now realize that all the academics become historians because you got tired of chasing the present. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I have to be more selective, right? So I can't talk about all digital culture, I can't talk about games, etc. I have to be very selective, even I can do it, but definitely it becomes more difficult. Next question, how has the database logic uh, influenced people's perception of reality since 2001? Okay, uh, no problem. I'm finishing, I'm, now I decided, you know, I'm going to write like, you know, I can't do this MIT press books because they kill me like five years, you know, these books. I give a manuscript, 100,000 uh, words, we edited, we made 13,000 edits. So I'm now promised to you, I promised you now, digital promise, uh, like it's better than communist promise, you know, digital off. I'm going to publish short book every year online for free. So I already finished one and a half this year. <laughs> and in fact, the first book talks exactly about this. It's called, the title is uh, The Art of a Data Stream. We kind of shift from database to a data stream for more detailed question, answer, read the book. Okay, done. Next, anonymous attendee. Okay. Uh, at, okay. What's your opinion of current state of our culture? Our culture means Italian or you, you, I don't know. Okay, and what do you think Asian culture has a strong influence today? Why Asian culture has strong influence today? Well, you know, let's look at the global middle class, right? That's, <laughs> uh, you know, I think I think partly the, the places which have strong influence if we economically kind of have influence, right? Uh, but it's also not so simple, right? Because you would think if China is so big, we should be all watching Chinese films and following Chinese fashion, but it's actually Japan, Japan still in Korea, right? Which is a tiny country, 50 million people. Uh, so... Um, I can't answer it. This question is actually very complicated, right? So I can't answer it in a kind of simple, in a simple way. Uh, would, would, right? Would take more time. But my answer is, you know, save some money for a ticket, go to Seoul, and you'll see. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, next one. Nam Jun Paik. Yes. Uh, so Nam Jun Paik is, in fact, the hero of my new book, The Art of a Data Stream. Uh, it starts by talking about his exhibition. In 1963, which supposedly where he claimed he was very good with PR and MJ Pike. He claims he invented video art. In fact, the television art was already proposed in Europe in 1947. Anyway, uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. yes, from discontinuous to continuous video mixer. 
is where you get something. But I, I, very interesting, but Donata, what is the question? I'm not sure I fully understand. Uh, sorry, let me go to the next one. What do you think about the role of gamification of future? Uh, change approach to how we gain knowledge. This is a good question, but yeah, well, it's another know, lecture, yeah, probably. Another lecture, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's. Uh, I don't know, right? I'm very kind of conservative, right? In my taste, I'm not being fan you know, of games or gamification because I play in life already. I don't, you know, I don't like to go to casino. You know, I find this to be super boring. So I actually find gamification is very boring. Uh, like I'm trying not to use any apps which gamify me. Like I'm using this you know, to to do list, which is best to do application. So it gives me this you know like a karma points, but maybe because I know too much about how it works, it doesn't affect me. But I think gamification is okay as long as people learn, right? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, basically we are basically we we really lost to Asia, right? I mean, you know, uh, all the top graduate schools in America, right? I mean, you know, Americans kind of get into most of the graduate schools because all taken by Asian students. So Americans are giving five things and Asians are sitting where on where on where behind and learning like crazy, you know? Okay, so you can gamify as long as you're not going to lose, you know, but, you know? and it's very pragmatic. In a moment like this, moment like this, moment like this, moment like this, everyone has access to the same tools. Well, no, most people don't know how to use internet. You know how I know? So I get invited to do various events, right? Not always as interesting as this one, maybe you know, once a week. Most people say, Lev Manovich, what is your, okay, I say, where can I find your CV? I said, well, you Google Manovich, and then my CV comes up. Oh, and then every two weeks, I get some message from some friend on Messenger, say, dear Lev, so-and-so was to invite you to give a talk. We can't connect, we can't find you. Google for my Google and find my email, right? So most people don't know, don't know how to use internet, you know. You know, uh, people, if if academics knew how to use internet, we would be so much better already, right? Okay. No, seriously. Therefore, same possibilities to produce content. What is the key to producing qualitatively better content? Work your ass off, okay? Work your ass off. You know, if people like some influencers may spend like you know eight hours to make one photograph, right? Uh, you know, if you walk, if you watch like, you know, YouTube videos about uh, photographers, right? May spend how many hours to make one photograph? Uh, the film editor at Netflix may spend three days to do rough cut of a two minute scene. Work, 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 right? Uh, you know, and I will finish this by telling you an uh, anecdote uh, about Lenin, you know, Lenin, All right? So, uh, so Lenin says, to his wife. Dear wife, I can't spend time with you. I'm going to spend weekend with my girlfriend. It's like, okay, sure, sure. We're all communists, we understand, we need some stimulation, dear comrade, go. And then he calls his, you know, calls his girlfriend, says, sorry, I can't spend time with you. My wife really needs me. Of course, dear comrade, of course, my darling, I understand, you have to be with family. So what do we say? Lenin tells his wife, he, go, he goes to his girlfriend, he tells her, when he goes to the library, and what he, he works, works and works. Okay, sorry, maybe it's not very politically correct, but kind of like, uh, but this is my, this is actually the answer, right? Uh, work, work and work. Uh, I work because I love it, because I don't know what else I'll be doing if I'm not working. I don't know what, what is a holiday because every every moment I write some idea in my notebook, it's like already a holiday, right? From worrying about all the emails I have to answer. Uh, so I'm not sure what it means to take holiday for creative people, but, if you have to, you can. Uh, maybe I'm too much American, but the point is that if you want to produce quality content, whether it is academic theory or YouTube or whatever. And, uh, but I have a particular advice also for students. Uh, I have a theory actually how to be successful, uh, involves data science, <laughs> but uh, you know, don't do, don't do what everybody else already doing because you're too late, right? So figure out how to predict the future figure out which things are emerging, right? And then uh, think, figure out which of these emerging things will be needed, and then be the first. I think the reason I'm here is not because I'm particularly good. Often my articles are not so great, but often I was the first one to write about something, right? <laughs> Even you get credit, right? Uh, so uh, whatever, okay, so don't spend time only learning about your field because you'll be obsolete in a few years, right? 
with no learn as much as possible about everything, travel, um, and um, and uh, learn how to anticipate the future. Uh, if I, you know, so that's basically my advice. <laughs> Works for me. Uh, something else. Uh, so this is, I think, we got to explain explain your background. Explain your background. Ah, the background. Ah, nice. Yes, finally. So we got you guys in the design school, right? How often do you see people using some design background? Why? Why? Okay, anyway, background, you know, I, I like, uh, you know, now these days, I think it's been fashionable for a couple of years, gradients, right? And gradients is very easy. There's a gradient tool in Photoshop. So um, I kind of had this idea that I want to make posters for my book, but I got lazy, I only made three. So I said, how can I make some nice background quickly for my posters? So I just started using gradient tool. And, uh, you know, it's uh, also nice, right? Nice colors, complementary, but not completely, right? Yellow and violet. I think it works well. Uh, but, you know, uh, I can also I can also like, reveal myself. Uh, but it's uh, because we live in my wife's uh, apartment, which belongs to her mother, uh, to her parents. It's like the 60s, 80s design. Uh, you know how this anecdote, right? People go to Kandinsky when he prepares in Bauhaus. It's like this Bauhaus house and everything is very modern. Even if you're his close friend, there's a secret door, he opens the door, you go to the second part of the house and then there's icons everywhere and he gives you tea, which is true. Okay, so I'll show you what's behind my background, okay? Seriously. Uh, okay, here it is, okay? Okay. <laughs> what else? Okay, is more questions? No, I think that for oh, no, probably we have another question about of Italo Zuffi. Uh, is the which one? No, from who? Yes, no. Uh, from I, well, you see, philosopher. Do why? You mean do why question or? No, uh, Italo Zuffi asked: Isn't trying to foresee the future a type of ideology? Ah, okay, yes, yes, aha, uh -huh. isn't trying to foresee future type of ideology. Uh, well, so, um, by Slavoj, yeah, 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 okay, because, so, okay, so I, of course, I got interested in the idea, right? Uh, you know, who is doing this kind of future studies? So, there's a Wikipedia page, future studies, so there's a you know, there's many different overlapping fields, right? There's a speculative design, uh, speculative architecture. Uh, with future studies, uh, people like in the 50s, like Rand Corporation, you know, using game theory to predict what happens in the realm of nuclear war, right, uh, during Cold War. Uh, but, you know, this is not ideology, uh, precisely. Not everything is ideology. Yeah, uh, thank God. Uh, only left, only leftist people think everything is ideology because we themselves think everything is ideology. It's a problem, you know. The problem of future is, you know, how to get rid of Marxists, you know, that's a problem, you know, who completely took over our public culture, it's, you know, especially in America, you know, that's a problem, you know, that's the biggest problem, you know, they're very hard to get rid of. Anyway, so the idea that, that you can have a science of the future, actually it was, um, this idea was proposed by uh, the, uh, Gilbert Wells, right, you know, the science fiction writer, in 1900, he gave a lecture, and he said, look, we should really have a science of the future, uh, you know, very nice short lecture when he published it as a book. And that was the kind of idea. And then I think, you know, there's a history, right, to this idea, 1950s, Cold War, when you have 1990s, uh, you know, people like uh, Ray Kurzweil, right, singularity. Uh, so you can actually track, like most ideas, you can track it to kind of particular places. But the question is like, why I'm interested? Well, I'm not so interested in the future, right, actually. Uh, I'm most interested in the present. Uh, I think for me, this is an interesting exercise because first of all, as I said, it's trying to get people to look at the present a bit like in a larger perspective. It's trying to get people to look at the previous centuries where people had very interesting, very different ideas about the future, uh, more interesting than today. Like, for example, like in, usually with my students, I show a work of Constant, right? The famous kind of architect, artist, Finkra, right? Who designed this so-called New Babylon, right? Which some of you know was this utopian project, but he was also very ironic about it. 
uh, from late 50s until mid 70s. And he mentioned this future where the computers have taken care of work, so humans don't have to work. So instead, right, we wander through this endless architectural kind of construction, this kind of superstructure, right, which covers the, the world. And uh, I'm involved in play, and uh, part of this play is that the environment is changes, right? So it's an incredibly sophisticated idea, and kind of more interesting than what we have today, right? So in a strange way, I'm interested in the future in order to look at the past, and to help uh, people uncover a variety of different ideas about human life, you know, human work, human art, which people already have in the past, because our human past is like science fiction. You know, the science fiction is 19th century. The science fiction is even 1995, when people thought the globalization will change, you know, internet, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, um, so maybe a way to discover the past, because past looks very boring, right? Very nerdy, so maybe if you kind of Look at the past from the lens of the future, it becomes more sexy. Maybe that's the idea. Professor Manovic, uh, unfortunately, our time is over. Uh, because Okay, okay, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, but it's okay. I think I'll look at the questions. I think we took care of, of, of most of it, yeah. Yes. Yes. We did. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so uh, much. Uh, th thank good you. job. Good job. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we, we really hope to meet you here in Milan next time, since you you, you have been guest of this town several times, uh, however, maybe in Korea, as you as you suggested. Right now, it's evening time in Korea. It's night, uh, while here, uh, it's around the noon. So, the yes. topic... So, 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 the students have until the end of the day to invent the future, and then, and then, submit, and then send me over... Uh, projects to drop into Dropbox, but by, by, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but you know, it's, it's, it, I want to say, guys, you know, this is the most difficult project, right? So even mm. though, like, I have to write about what my Moscow students did, very wonderful, but the idea of the future was, okay, in the future we'll have, like, a, I don't know, we'll have, like, a organic coffee and uh, some kind of, uh, you know, like, right, uh, recycled, recycled fashion. I said, yeah, but we already have it. It's, it's very, I think it's very hard for people to think like 10, 20, 30 years ago. So that's why maybe it's a good idea. You know? It's so hard. Maybe it's too hard. But anyway, um, so I hope, I know sometimes I speak too fast, but it's only because I feel a certain emotional connection to you. Um, and um, um, I do hope, you know, that we'll have a chance to speak more slowly, slow, slow thinking, uh, maybe next year. Uh, and yes. uh, thank you so much and uh, again thank you so much for honoring me uh, you know there is so much to talk about why particular chairs became famous in history of industrial design and uh, why 1968 was the most creative year after 1999 I'm sure between Leonardo, Amos, Stefano and this robot Somebody has one answer. So thank, you so, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was really uh, an incredible pleasure to stay with you for mm. the last seminar of our public program, uh, Mid Explosion, Professor Manu. Really. Yes. Last thing. So, you know, I, I go to, you know, there's 20, 20 independent bookstores in my city, a small city in Korea. I go over, look what I find. I, I, never, oh, really? I never knew about this book. I never knew about it. Just like racist in Korea, so I'm going to read it. I'm going to cafe and going to read this book. And it looks, looks really, it looks amazing. It looks amazing. I'm sure you all know that, but yeah. somehow he's not so well known, I think, globally now. So, so you know. <laughs> so maybe, maybe the next book is going to be called Learning from Milan. You know, how Milan can tell us, teach us about the future, because I think this town had so much intelligence, sometimes embedded in design, uh, but sometimes when people forget that behind design there's ideas. Of people, people like him, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, really, we we really hope to go on with this conversation here in the Alley of Nava or whatever, but here in Milan next time. Thank you very much. Thank you to Thank you so to our uh, attendees, and uh, it has been a really a really lovely couple of hours of discussion. So and uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Manovich.